fact that the thief hit his thumb with a hammer twice.
I'd like to welcome you guys all out here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'd like to thank Brother Stevens for the time he takes out to uh, the time to study, to, to enlighten us, to help us um, progress in our studies. Um, we're going to have Brother Peterson give the opening prayer, and then after that, we'll turn the time over to Brother Stevens, and we'll get started. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this evening, grateful that we can gather together to come and hear instruction from President Stevens. We're grateful for this opportunity to learn. We ask you to please bless us with thy spirit here this night, that our minds will be open and receptive, that we'll be able to gather the things that we need to learn and be able to use them and in our studies and in our life. We're grateful that we our members of this church, that we have the gospel in our life. We're grateful for our knowledge of our Savior and of his atonement and the plan of salvation. We're grateful for all these things. We love thee, Father, and we say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I welcome you this evening you who are here in the chapel and those who might be online watching this evening we will cover three of the four major prophets we're going to deal with jeremiah ezekiel and daniel all three of the books have a great uh, many prophecies that deal with this dispensation especially uh, with the conflict that's going on in the middle east ezekiel really will become important when we get there and we take a look at that. What I'll do this evening as we start the book of Jeremiah, I'm going to teach it sequentially and not with a thematic approach. Thematic with Jeremiah would be very difficult. Sequential is far more easy. And the reason for that, I'm going to cover four areas in the book of Jeremiah. One, his life. So we'll just pick it up as we get to it. Things that we know about him. Two, his teachings. Three, the wickedness of the people, and four, the Latter-day prophecies. And there are substantial prophecies that deal uh, in the book of Jeremiah. So uh, with that much, we're going to start in Jeremiah chapter 1. If you have your scriptures and want to just follow. I'll also uh, try and give you notes as we go, which has been... Uh, something I guess I've done for years to try and help people with the scriptures and to make them a little bit easier so that uh, they can be understood. Because I know in places the language is archaic and it is difficult for many members to understand. So let's we'll start with chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah of the priests that were Ananoth in the land of Benjamin. Ananoth was a city given by Elazar, and Joshua was given to the tribe of Levi. It becomes a refuge city. And that's where the Levites lived, or the priests. And so Jeremiah's father is a priest. Jeremiah is from the tribe of Levi. When Lynette and I, my wife, when we lived in Israel, we lived in what's called the French Hills uh, area. In the Old Testament, it's called Nob Hill, which also a very, very significant place. I could go just uh, out of the apartment and just up uh, on the top. There's a little park up there. It's not a park like you'd think today. It's just open, a dirt spot's what it is. And I could look to the northeast when the lights was on at night, and I could see on an oath. It's about three miles, three and a half miles from Jerusalem, still there today. <laughs> And it is owned by the Arabs. They're the ones that live in this little town of Ananoth. So that becomes important. I would note by that Joshua 21, 17 to 18. And that's where uh, you'll get the information I give you that uh, Elazar and Joshua are the ones who gave that city to the tribe of uh, Levi. Okay, verse 2, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign, 
You might want to know he was a good man, a righteous man who tried to clean out the idolatry in the land. And it would have been a good time for Jeremiah to live during his reign. But the kings that follow are all evil kings. And so it would have been very, very difficult for this wonderful man to have to live with the kings that follow this one. But at least with Josiah, he was a very righteous man and he was a good man. He reigned, and I'll give you the dates, but always remember these are dates by scholars, so they have question marks. They might not be 100 proof as to accuracy. But Josiah reigned from 640 to 609 B.C., righteous king. Second Chronicles chapter 35, verse 25, we learn that when Josiah was killed, he was killed up in the Megiddo area, killed by the Egyptians in a battle. And Jeremiah mourned his death when he died because he was a good man. From this point on with Jeremiah, he will have a very difficult mission and assignment from the Savior after the death of Josiah. Verse 3, it came also in the days of uh, Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. This Zedekiah in 2 Kings 24, you'll see his name is Madaniah. They will change it to the Babylonian Zedekiah, which is the one that's more famous to us. Now, let me add to verse 3 the kings that are left out. And then you'll see why in just a minute that they're left out. After Josiah, the next king is Jehoahaz. J-E-H-O-A-H-A-Z is how you spell his name. He is a very evil man. He is the son of Josiah also. He only served for three months. That's why he's left out of that verse. He is then followed by Jehoiakim, and his name then is in verse 3. He will reign from 609 to 598 B.C., so he's there for about 11 uh, years. Son of Josiah, he is a wicked king, a very evil man. He is then followed by Jehoiachin, or Kin. Jehoiachin, I think is how you say, say that. He was a king for three months, so that's why you see the two have been left out. He was an evil king. And I have no interest in pursuing the history of any of these kings because you can go into the book of Second Kings and read what information there is on them. I'm more interested in uh, Jeremiah's teachings. He then is followed by Zedekiah, who's in verse 3. He reigns from 598 to 587 B.C. So he's there for about 12 years. He was the son of King uh, Josiah. If you have the, the Book of Mormon, and we'll turn to 1 Nephi, chapter 1. First Nephi 1, verse 4. For it came to pass in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, my father Lehi, having dwelt at Jerusalem in all his days. And in that same year there came many prophets prophesying unto the people, they must repent or the great city Jerusalem must be destroyed. So the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, many prophets came. One of them was Lehi. So we pick up Lehi at this time. Lehi surely would have personally known Jeremiah. There is no way that he would not have known Jeremiah. And from my study of the Old Testament, it appears to me that Jeremiah is the presiding high priest and that he is in charge. And many prophets are sent during the reign of Zedekiah to teach the people, Lehi then being one of those who was sent. Another note that you might want to be aware of is from Zedekiah comes Mulek who somehow, with the help of others, is uh, probably a child, escaped the slaughter in Jerusalem, and he ended up in America, where we pick up with the Mulekites. How he got there and so forth, it does not say in the Book of Mormon. That'll be a good question in the millennium that you can ask that one and a thousand others that we have about the Scriptures that the Savior will help us. It'll only take a few minutes to explain all of this uh, to us. 
I would also note by Zechariah, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 11 and 12, where we learn that Zedekiah rejected Jeremiah, who was one of the prophets that tried to teach him. Zedekiah rejected him. Okay, let's come back to the text to verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, before you were conceived in the mortality, I knew thee. Now, when it says, I knew thee, it means more than just to call him by name. The Son of God knew Jeremiah. He knew of his character. He knew of his abilities, of his loyalty, of his faith, of his obedience. All of those things he would have known. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. The word sanctified is interesting. Note, he was sanctified before he came out of the womb. That has reference to pre-earth life. <clears throat> you become sanctified, brothers and sisters, by keeping the commandments. There were commandments in pre-earth life. We were taught the plan of salvation. Here is a man who was loyal in pre-earth life, who had the help of the Holy Ghost then, who kept God's commandments, who was very much aware of the atonement that the Son of God would work out, and he was loyal to God. Always he was loyal to God in prayer life. He was one of the mighty ones there. He says, and I ordained thee a prophet. That's interesting also. To ordain means to set apart for a specific calling or assignment. We very well will find out that the way individuals were ordained in prayer life is the same way they are here, by someone putting their hands on your head and ordaining you to a certain mission or assignment. And the Savior says that he was ordained a prophet before he was ever born. Now, also be aware, and this is probably no mystery to the members of the church, we did not live on the planet that God the Father lives on. He lived on a resurrected, exalted planet, a celestial planet. There's no sin on that planet. We lived on a spirit world in celestial glory in the presence of the Father, but we were not on the immediate planet that he was on. Now note, I ordained the prophet unto the nations. That's plural. That's interesting also that he would say, I ordained the prophet unto the nations. That means his teachings would go to the nations. How prophetic is that? Only God could bring that about concerning a prophet from a small town in Israel. He comes from Ananol. Most people have no idea that there is a place, and if they do, they don't have any idea where it's even at. I didn't either until I lived there and come to know where it was at. Not very big. And that's where he's, he's from, an obscure individual from an obscure town. His teachings is what would be known throughout the nations. Thus the Lord preserved what? The book of Jeremiah, which then goes to the nations of the earth. So whether or not we can see the hand of God fully in that, we can at least testify that God did bring about the teachings of this great man and has sent them to the nations of the earth, which tells me that there's some material in there that is very important to the world, especially to the members of this church, that we should come to understand. So that verse 5, very significant, a lot of information in one little verse. Uh, let's go over to verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, which means he gives him power or authority to speak for God. That's what the symbolism of that means. And, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I would note by that Doctrine and Covenant section 1, verse 38, where the Lord says that whether from his own mouth or that of his servants, it is the same. Doctrine and Covenants 1, 38. <coughs> now, verse 10 is the major theme of the book. This is the verse that we want to understand because this is the theme that's going to run through all the rest of the chapters. Here it is. I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. This is all that means. To root out means so the gardener can replant. 
because it's not a productive area. When he says to pull down so the great architect can rebuild. So what is it that he's saying in that verse? I will scatter Israel and I will gather Israel and they will become a holy people. The great gathering of the house of Israel is underway. Why are there wars and violence in the nations? Stop missionary work. Keep our missionaries out. The world might be deceived by all of that, but you and I aren't because we understand the gospel and the scriptures. The conflict in the earth is between Satan and those who are evil and uphold him in this church. He has to stop us as we move towards our destiny with the Son of God and the great millennial reign, which obviously draws very close. Let's go down to verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. An almond tree in that land is one of the first trees to bloom. It blooms almost immediately. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. As that almond tree so quickly uh, blossoms in that land begins to produce, the Lord is saying, So will I fill my word. In other words, the destruction of Jerusalem, not very far away. And we pick that a lot of that up in the Book of Mormon. The word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot. A seething pot is one that spills or boils over. Spills or boils over. And the face thereof is towards the north. Well, what is it towards the north that is going to destroy? It is Babylon. They will destroy Jerusalem. And they will take captive uh, many individuals, and they will be in that land for 70 years before God sees fit to bring them back. When it says uh, the seething part then symbolizes disaster, which is then the coming of Babylon. If you want to note that there, that's what that means. Seething pond is disaster, and Babylon is the one who will come to destroy Okay, now, brother and sister, there's no way that I can work all the verses and go through it. We would be here on the book of Jeremiah for a long time. So what I've done is elected to miss and hit various verses just to teach and to help. So I apologize for doing that, but there's just no way I can do it any other way. So chapter 2 to verse 2. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem. In other words, a plea, touch their hearts. Here is a final warning from a mighty prophet and others uh, who also were involved. Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. He has reference to the days of Moses when he brought Israel out of Egypt and he brought him into the wilderness to bring him into a land that is not sown means that they were totally dependent on God. We have studied the Old Testament and how God provided manna and quail for them. We also know that for 40 years, their clothing never wore out. Now, that's good and bad, I guess. You know, if your sisters or brethren, you want new clothes and they're not wearing out, but at least it's... Uh, a benefit. They didn't have big stores. They'd go get more clothes. Their clothes didn't even wear out. And so the Lord reminds them of what he had done for them, how easily people forget. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. In other words, God watched over Israel. Many stories with that, with the Amalekites and others where he watched over them, blessed them, loved them, protected them. And now they have turned against him. Come down now to verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. Number one, they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters. Now there are multiple references <clears throat> that deal with that. I have time to look at only one. So I'm going to look at the one in Revelation chapter 21 where the Savior speaks of the living water, because this will explain <clears throat> so that you and I understand what that means. Uh, 
Revelation 21, verse uh, 6. Here we read, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him, him faithful members of my church, that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. The fountain of the life of the water of life is the water of eternal life. And note what he says freely. It means this. We will come to eventually know all things. That's the promise. We are in process of doing the best we can. We're trying to understand the scriptures, the teachings of the prophets, to prepare us for the millennial reign in which the Son of God and the mighty ones will advance us even further with greater knowledge. And eventually we'll go on with celestial bodies to grow to the point where someday into the eternities we will know all things. For the Son of God will freely teach, love, guide, and help us. That's the promise that he makes to all generations. Some have accepted and others have chosen not to. Now, I only looked at one reference. There are half a dozen that deal with that. Okay, there's one, two, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Okay, a cistern can be a natural underground thing or it can be man-made where they collect the water and put it in it. When he says they're broken, that means that they don't contain the water. That is a reference to the worship of false gods. Instead of worshiping the living God, they have turned to the worship of false gods, and they can't teach you anything, absolutely nothing. And so he tells them they're guilty then of those two things. Let's now go to chapter 3. And I'm going to go over to verse 12. Verse 12 through 19 deals with the latter days. Here is a prophecy that deals with this dispensation of time. He says, go and proclaim these words toward the north. The north uh, in Old Testament is the seed of gloom and darkness. Anciently, they saw the north as a place of gloom and darkness. It is also interesting enough the direction of Israel's exile. They'll take them into an area where it's dark and gloomy, an uh, area where it's just false gods that they worship, Marduk, Bel, and other false gods the Babylonians had, and say, return thou backsliding Israel. The word return means repent. To say return, it's like if you're going someplace and I, uh, you're walking and I say, well, wait a minute, stop. You're going the wrong way. You need to come back. You need to return. That's how return is used in the Old Testament because somebody eliminated the word repentance. He's telling them to repent. Backsliding Israel means they've been continually going the wrong way. Instead of moving towards the light and knowledge of the Son of God, they backslide. Saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. That's a promise. For I am merciful, and we ought to catch that. The Son of God will forgive. He dearly loves us. He wouldn't have worked out the atonement if he didn't love us. And we should always remember that when Satan tries to browbeat us that we can't make it. We can make it. And I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. To acknowledge your iniquity means to confess. And depending on the nature of the sin, that will require the help of priesthood leaders in that day and in this day. Whereas other sins can be resolved uh, by yourself or with the help of a family member, or if you've offended a neighbor, you can resolve with them. But some sins will require priesthood help. So to acknowledge thine iniquity is to confess. It also means to repent and to be humble and obedient. Because unless we're repentant and humble and obedient, we will not confess. We just will not do it. It's too hard, especially in our day. And do you know why? Because the bishop knows us. He's our neighbor. He's our friend. We don't want him to know we're guilty of doing such things. And so the devil's tricked us not to go and see him. The other thing Satan has tricked us with is that the bishop will tell and everybody in the ward will find out. I want you to know that is an absolute lie. Bishops do not talk. Uh, if you took thousands of them, you might find one that would do that, I suppose. But they do not talk. That's why God put them there is because he trusts them. And they do keep the secrets and they love the people. 
that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. That has reference to idolatry. And ye have not obeyed my voice, which is found in two places, in scriptures and prophets. So when it says they haven't obeyed his voice, they haven't been reading the scriptures, they're not studying the scriptures, and they reject the prophets who have been sent among them, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. Now, if he's married unto us, to the house of Israel, then we should be loyal to him. Is that not true? Is that what it means in a marriage partnership, that each party is loyal to the other one? And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. That is missionary work in the last days. You who have served in the mission field probably literally saw that fulfilled, where you baptized one in a family that wanted to be part, and the rest of the family rejected and didn't want to be part of that. I remember so well in Columbia teaching a young lady who uh, wanted to be baptized and join the church, and her dad was a minister of another church, and it broke his heart, but she had the faith and courage to to follow through. I also taught a young man, he was 19. He was studying to be a Presbyterian minister, choice, choice young man. He lived in St. Louis, but was in Columbia, Missouri at the Theologian uh, Seminary there. We taught him he wanted to be baptized. When he told his parents, uh, they were so strong against it that he decided he'd wait. And I left the area and to this day, I don't know what happened, whether he resumed the ministry or eventually he came to the truth, and uh, again, it was part of it. So I don't know what happened to him. I will bring you to Zion. Zion is the holy city that will yet be built, a place of sanctuary, a place where the Son of God will administer. I will give you pastors. Pastors are shepherds. They are priesthood leaders. Generally, we think of them as bishops and stake presidents. According to mine heart, in other words, who will select them? God will. He doesn't make mistakes as he calls individuals. Now, I've come to know this years ago in my life, that priesthood leaders can make mistakes. I understand that. Lorenzo Snow said once, did Brigham Young make mistakes? Yes. Did I ever see them? No. That is good advice. If you watch a priesthood leader long enough, you'll probably see him do something that you object to. That's not worth your time. We should pray for him and overlook their weaknesses. He says, which shall feed you. To feed is to nourish. Note how he nourishes us with knowledge and understanding. That'll require revelation. That'll require scriptures. That'll require prophets to be able to do that. That means that in the latter days, there will be living apostles and prophets on the earth who will give clear direction to the pastors, to the shepherds, who in turn will teach and instruct those that they preside over. Shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land that is underway and being fulfilled. We're now being, we're multiplying throughout the world in the various nations. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall I remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. That's an interesting phrase also, uh, brothers and sisters. It's the meaning, the fulfillment of the old covenant which is given way to the new covenant, the establishment of the new covenant. He says, at that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. That is not fulfilled yet, but will be. Jerusalem and Independence, Missouri, will be the two world capitals of the world. And there the Son of God will have a throne, which means two things. One, he presides, and two, he's a judge. And also a third one, he is a king. In the millennium, it will be uh, a government under a king. That is the best government you can have. You can't have a better government than that if the man's name is King Benjamin or Mosiah or Russell Nelson, then you'd be okay. But also, a king can be the worst government you can have if his name is Noah in the Book of Mormon. But in the millennial reign, the one who will sit on the throne will be the king of all Israel, the son of God. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. 
Neither shall they walk anymore after the imagination of their evil heart. What a wonderful day when all of the wickedness ceases. He says, in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. They shall come together out of the land of the north. Let me take a minute with that. Isaiah 11 helps with that also. Remember after the death of Solomon that Israel split into two nations, Jeroboam over the north and Rehoboam over the south. The south will be called the southern kingdom and Judah. The northern kingdom will be called northern kingdom, Israel and Ephraim. It had three titles. They will even come to the point where there will be wars between them. And then when it says they shall come together out of the land of the north, there's a direct reference to the lost tribes. The day will come when God will restore and bring back the lost tribes. And finally, Israel will be a united covenant people. And <clears throat> that means we'll have had to have turned to the Jewish nation and to have taught them also to fulfill that. So that prophecy is a ways off. Now, I know that there are those very prominent people who say that the lost tribes have simply lost their identity and been scattered, and maybe that's true. But what I've decided a long time ago is when the Savior said they're lost, that's what he meant, they're lost. So I don't waste my time trying to figure out where they're at and, and so forth. I just assume when the Lord wants to give details on that, he'll give details on it. And so I've left that one alone. To the land that I've given for inheritance unto your fathers. The fathers there is Abraham and Joseph. And now you need to separate them. I didn't say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and Joseph. I said Abraham and Joseph. The bulk of the tribes will inherit the land promised to Abraham, which goes from Egypt to Iran. All of that will be their inheritance. The tribe of Joseph receives all of the Americas. And that will be the inheritance of the covenant people as those areas. But I said, how shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the host of nations? And I said, thou shalt call me my father, and it shall not turn away from me. Now when it says, thou shalt call me my father, note my uppercase. Do you know who the father is in that verse? It's not God, our eternal heavenly father. It's Jesus the Christ. And how is he our father? Doctrine and Covenants 25 verse 1 explains, so does Mosiah 15. If we accept the conditions of the atonement, if we are baptized, have faith, repent, and are baptized, receive the Holy Ghost, we are spiritually adopted into the family of Christ. He becomes a spiritual father to us. And therefore, he said he'd do what for his family? He'll share his birthright with us. The father give everything to him. It all belongs to the Son of God. He has promised in turn to that righteous family who love him, uphold him. He will share all of it with us. My Father is Christ. Uh, verse 22. He says, Return, repent, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. I would note by that, because that is significant. Heal has reference to the atonement. The atonement of Jesus Christ heals. And all of us will be grateful throughout the eternities for that because we've all done things we wished we hadn't have done. By repenting and keeping commandments, we are healed through the everlasting atonement of Christ. What a great and glorious and wonderful promise that he extends to all of us. I'm going to go now, brothers and sisters, to chapter 5 to verse uh, 1. He says, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. That denotes uh, haste. And see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if you can find a man, if there be any that execute the judgment, that seeketh the truth, then I will pardon it. In other words, that is a, almost a similar promise that God made to Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, he told Abraham, if you can find 10 good people there, I'll spare it. And this is what, in essence, he's saying here, run to and fro, go down the streets, check every place, and see if you can find enough good people that I can spare it. Similar thing, then, that was done to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'd put by Genesis 18, verse 23 through 32. Genesis 18, 23 to 32. Verse 2. 
And though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return to repent. No matter how hard the chastisement has been to them, they still won't repent. And that is difficult to understand. They've already had wars and bloodsheds and all kinds of problems, and yet they will not repent. And it's about to get worse. <clears throat> the destruction at the time of Babylon, when they come in there, it must have been horrible what took place in there. But that was what they chose. Come down to verse 7. How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me. Do you know who he's speaking to? Speaking to the parents. Why have the children forsaken him? Because they were raised to be wicked by parents who taught them the sin of idolatry. And so you have to be careful as you read and study. He is condemning the parents. Section 68 is clear, a warning to the parents. If you do not teach your children the gospel, you will not have a place in Zion. That's in our day that the Lord has said that. Sworn by them that are no gods, in other words, idolatry. When I had fed them to the full, they then committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. That's not what you think. He's not talking about the sin of idol uh, adultery as you think of it. He's talking about the worship of the false gods. Remember, he is the true God. We are married to him. So how is it we should conduct ourselves? We should be loyal to him. So he uses a sin that everybody can understand, and he likens them worshiping those false gods as guilty of what? Being adulterers, because they're disloyal to him. They've forsaken him in the covenants. They've turned to the false gods. And when he says they assemble themselves by troops in the harlots' houses, they constantly go to the various locations of the idols to worship them. So he uses a very serious sin that we can understand, but you have to catch the symbolism as to what it is that he's saying to appreciate it. Now, this next verse is about as blunt as you can get in this book, and I'm not going to do too much with it. He says, they were as fed horses. Note what it says in the footnote. In the Hebrew, it means lusty stallions. Now, anybody that's been around horses or stallions will understand this. They were as fed horses in the morning. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. That sounds to me like one sick, Place to live. When he likens those men to nothing more than an animal who craves his neighbor's wife and is lustful and commits adultery and is evil, that is strong language that the Son of God uses in that particular verse. Let's go over now to verse 15. He says, Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, reference to Babylon. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, it is one, a mighty nation, powerful. Two, it is an ancient nation, an old nation. Three, a nation whose language thou knowest not. You cannot speak their language. Neither understandest what they say. That would be difficult then to be conquered by a nation. You don't know what they're saying. Their quiver is as an open sepulcher, meaning filled with death. If you open the quiver, it's like saying that those arrows and that are ready to come out and to kill. And so when he says that a, a quiver is an open sepulcher, it means it's filled with death. When they make their appearance, they come to kill, to destroy. Verse 18. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end with you. The destruction by Babylon will not be totally complete. There will be some who will live and remain in Jerusalem. There will be others taken captive whom Cyrus will release in 70 years. 19, it shall come to pass when ye shall say, Wherefore doth the Lord our God all these things unto us? Then shalt thou answer them like as you have forsaken me and serve strange gods in your land. So shall ye serve strangers in a land that is not yours. Strangers, Gentiles, heathens, those who have no interest in your beliefs or your worship or your culture. And there you will serve them in captivity. Reference to the Babylonian captivity. Let's go to chapter 7. I'm going to start with verse 2. 
Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. That's the temple. Proclaim there this word. And say, hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Okay, this discourse, these teachings are given at the temple. Why? Perhaps the Lord is hoping through this great prophet that the people will be more attentive, more willing to change when they stand in the place that's supposed to be sacred and holy. <clears throat> they don't change, however. Verse 3. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. The God of Israel means the covenant people. Israel is a covenant name. Amend your ways and your doings, and I'll cause you to dwell in this place. That's a warning with a promise. If they will make the change, he will not destroy them, and they'll be able to remain in Jerusalem. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. In other words, the false prophets have told them that God loves them, that they're his people because of that temple that stands there. If that was not true, God would destroy that temple. That's the logic that they're using with them, uh, the false prophets. We know that what we're doing is okay because that temple stands there, and that's God's house, and we can go in it. And that must have been offensive. Now, uh, let's come down to, uh, well, let me finish, uh, verse 4. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways, your doings, if ye thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, shed not innocent blood in this place. And I'll explain that one in a minute. Neither walk after other gods to your hurt. Hurt there means spiritually. When you uh, go after the false gods, you will hurt yourself spiritually. Uh, this is going to be a bold statement here tonight. But brothers and sisters, you start reading some of the books that you read, of some of the fanatics that are writing books and that our people are buying, you will hurt yourself spiritually. Read the books written by members of the 12 in the first presidency. Read the conference reports. If you want to really learn the gospel, if you're serious and you want to understand the plan of salvation, read those books. I get phone calls and letters. Even now, after all these years, I still get them about a particular book. And uh, one I was asked a little while ago, I did not know the author, hadn't heard of him. So I checked with correlation on him, and he, they told me he is a religious fanatic. That's the words that they used. And yet our people are buying his particular book and reading it and just learning all kinds of neat things that no prophet knows anything about or has ever taught. Now, whenever you start reading something that prophets haven't spoken on, you're in trouble. And so be careful that you don't hurt yourself spiritually by reading things that you should not read. Then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, forever and ever. To live there in the promised land, you must be righteous. And I have mentioned before, and I will again tonight, the land, the terrible war that's going on in the Middle East, that land does not belong to the Jews, and it doesn't belong to the Arabs. Neither one of them get that land. That land belongs to covenant Israel. The day will come when our missionaries will walk those streets. We will teach both groups. Those who accept and come into the fold become covenant Israel, the righteous seed of Abraham, and they get the land. The rest will be removed. Happy day when all of that finally comes and all this violence ends. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Lying words has reference directly to false prophets. Always there are those who know more than the brethren. In that day and in this day, it really is sad, sad commentary upon us. Uh, verse 9, now, will ye steal, which means they are, will ye murder, that's what they're doing, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense unto Baal. Baal is the Phoenician storm god. He's the creator god. He is the false god that's replaced the great Jehovah. And walk after other gods whom ye know not. And come and stand before me in this house, the temple, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. In other words, 
It's a retreat for them. After they commit all these sins, then they can come to the temple and worship, and they're okay because this is God's house, and he would destroy it if they were doing something they shouldn't do. And how you get that kind of a mindset, I don't know. You'll have to help me understand. I, I don't understand that. But go ye now into my place, which was in Shiloh. And I've been there many times to Shiloh or Shiloh. And uh, that's where the temple, the portable tabernacle that Moses had, that's where they erected it. Remember, Eli was the custodian and these two wicked sons. They were the custodians. Well, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant and to that uh, temple? The Philistines destroyed the temple. They actually got, uh, burned it down, destroyed it, and they took the Ark of the Covenant. Eli was so upset when he heard the news. He was 90 years old. He fell over backwards and broke his neck. Eli, Zebedee Coulter, said of him, he lost his soul forever because he did not correct those wicked boys. Where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And I just put by that the days of Eli is what he has reference to, brothers and sisters. That's when it's destroyed. I would also put by it 1 Samuel chapter 4. That's where you can read about the destruction that took place in the days of Eli. So what is it God is saying? He said, if you think that temple is going to save you with the sins you're committing, you need to uh, go back up to Shiloh and have a history lesson because you've forgotten that I destroyed that temple by the hand of the Philistines because of the wickedness that happened, and this temple won't save you either, and Babylon will destroy uh, the temple. 13, and now because you've done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, rising up early, as soon as it is light, who's on the streets, who's in the buildings, who's at the gates teaching, the prophets of God, warning, blessing, loving, trying to help the people. But ye heard not. I called you, but ye answered not. Called through authorized priesthood holders, and they would not listen to them. One of which was Lehi, and he speaks of their disobedience. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. That's the, the warning. I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren even the whole seed of Ephraim, which has become known at this point as the lost tribes of Israel. They have been removed from the promised land where the Lord put them. We do not know. Assyria took them captive in the days of uh, the Assyrian kings and warlords. And then somehow with the help of prophets, they escaped Assyria. They headed back towards their own land. And when they knew they had lost the Assyrians, they turned north and become lost. Now, that'll be interesting to read. I would think that it wouldn't be very hard to track thousands upon thousands of people, would it? You should be able to follow that pretty easy. There was a great miracle that took place whereby Assyria could no longer find them and didn't know where they went. And today, we don't know where they went. Therefore, pray not <laughs> thou for this people, neither lift up, cry, nor pray for them. Imagine what God just said. He told the prophet of God, please do not pray for them anymore. I will not even answer your prayers in their behalf because of their own wickedness and their own selfishness. I would, uh, I would note by that uh, Mormon, I think it's chapter 1, verse 16. You might have to check. I don't see that I wrote it down here, but I think that's what it is. And that's where Mormon is told that he is not to pray for the people or to teach the people anymore, that God will not listen if he teaches them. Okay, 16 or 17. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Jude and in the streets? Okay, this is public. This is not hidden. And he's saying to Jeremiah, don't you see what they're doing in the various cities that you've been to? in the streets that you've walked down. Here's what they're doing. The children gather wood. The fathers kindle the fire. The women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. That's some kind of worship in Egypt that was going on. And to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, and they may provoke me to anger. In other words, what? The entire family is involved in idolatry. 
Now, it does not do our Father in heaven any good to send more of his spirit children to families like that. They'll just corrupt them, and he will lose them too. The best thing that could happen is to remove them. Even it has to be a harsh way. And even with children, they're better off in the world of spirits. You and I sometimes get the wrong idea about death. You will find out one day, brothers and sisters, all of us will we'll get our turn, that death is a very small matter. And I mean that sincerely, a very small matter. But you want to die faithful when you go to the other side. And because the Lord God brings small children home, they're better off in the paradise than in families like that doing uh, the worship of false gods. So we ought to be careful sometimes when some of this we read. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Uh, a great rebuke. Let's go over to 25. He says, Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Okay, from their history of coming out of Egypt to the present, God has had prophets among the people. We are talking hundreds of years that he's been trying to help them. Yet they hardened, hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck. That's pride. And a person that's filled with pride, you cannot teach them. It just cannot be done. They won't listen to you. Let's come over to verse 30. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to pollute it. I'd put 2 Kings 21, verse 4, verse 7. They even have put idols in the temple that they worship. 2 Kings 21, verse 4, verse 7. Now we come in the next verse to the climax of their terrible sins and wickedness. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. If we were in Jerusalem, I could show you really easy how it all worked. Where the city of David was located, which was about 15 acres, on the west side of that was the Tyropian Valley, which was steep down. Over on the east side was the Kidron, also very steep, steep even today. The Tyropian's been filled in. Over on the south end is the Hinnom, and it is steep into the bottom of that gulch over there. They have built in the days of Jeremiah some kind of a platform or something. They build them huge fires down in there and then walk out on that platform and they throw their children into that fire. They're worshiping the god Moloch, which requires human sacrifice. Now, you talk about people coming to the ultimate of sin and evil, that they can do something like that. I would also put by that Jeremiah 19, verse 4 through 6, where there's even a little more detail. Jeremiah 19, verse 4 through 6. And then just as a reminder, remember in the Book of Mormon what was said of Laman and Lemuel? They were like the people of Jerusalem. Surely by now you got a glimpse of how bad they were. Nephi has my pure sympathy. I had to put up with those two knotheads as long as he had to put up with them for them to say in the Book of Mormon they were just like the people of Jerusalem. And we know they were murderers. If God hadn't have intervened, they'd have killed their own father. And surely they would have killed Nephi several times if they'd been able to. Okay, let's go now to chapter 9. I'm only going to look at one verse, and it's verse 16. He says this, I will scatter them also among the heathen. Heathen is Gentiles, whom neither they nor they nor their fathers have known. Now, that's interesting. They know about Assyria. They know about Babylon. They know about Egypt, and they might have known about the Hittites. But he is saying he's going to scatter them among nations that they have never heard of nor that they have known. So where is it that he scattered them? among all nations. What is our assignment? Go find them. I'll show you something of that in Jeremiah 16. I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. They will be disorganized and disbanded. The sword has followed the Jewish people up to the present time. 
One of the greatest examples of the slaughter with the Jews is the Crusaders. There was nothing holy or righteous about the Crusaders, nothing. They were violent and cruel and evil, the Crusaders, on their way to the Holy Land, they're rid of the horrid Turks and the Jews, mass murdering the Jews as they crossed through Europe. Crusaders was a terrible group of people. Let's uh, go to chapter 10 for a minute. Verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, Gentiles. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. Okay, here's where they run into some of their problems. What are some of the signs of heaven that they picked up and began to worship the heavens and that? Well, maybe it was a comet streaking across the heavens, and they come up with some weird idea of what it was. Maybe it's an eclipse of the moon or some other wonder that they hadn't seen before. All of those things, they become superstitious, and they set up false gods. Three, for the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they deck it with silver, with gold, they fasten it with nails, with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Know what God just said? This God that they make out of a tree and decorate it has to be carried because it can't move on its own. Now, you would think that it would register in somebody's head what he just said to them, wouldn't you? That you have to carry your God because he has no life that he can do anything on his own. And that's what he's saying to them, but it didn't have much effect. Let's go to chapter 11 and to verse uh, 13. Oh, this is where I put the Mormon one. For according to the number of the cities were thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have ye set up altars, to that shameful thing even altars to burn incense unto Baal. Burn incense is pray. They are praying to Baal. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them. I will not hear. That's where I put Mormon chapter 1, verse 16 also. So a second place where you might want to put that, where Mormon was told he was not to preach for the people. Go to 15. What hath my beloved? My beloved is Israel to do in mine house, temple. Seeing she, no feminine tense, because Christ is what? Masculine tense. Thus, we're the bride, feminine tense. She hath wrought lewdness with many. Lewdness reference to immorality with who? The false gods. And the holy flesh is passed from thee. That one's footnoted for you. See, it says acceptable sacrifice has ceased. When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. They delight in doing evil things. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. In other words, at one time they were productive. With the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it. They are now apostate. The tree is withered and dry. It's not productive, and it's an apostate group of people. And the branches that are broken, that means scattered. Scattered. He's had to scatter them. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee, established thee, have pronounced evil against thee. For the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves, to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal. And the Lord hath given me knowledge of it, and I know it. Then thou show, showedest me these things. In other words, brothers and sisters, you cannot hide sin from God's prophets. Okay, it cannot be done. It cannot be hid from God's prophets. Okay, let's come over for a minute to 19. He said, but I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. That I'll, I'll finish it, but that's a type. It speaks of Jeremiah, who then becomes a type of Christ. He said the same things. Let us cut him off and remove him. But, O Lord of hosts, that judges righteously, that triest the reins and, and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I revealed my cause. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of the men of 
and an oath that seek thy life, saying, Prophesy not in the name of the Lord, that thou die not by our hand. Note, his own hometown are plotting to kill Jeremiah. That has to be, brothers and sisters, family and friends, does it not? Who was it that took Christ up to a brow of a hill to throw him off and kill him? It was Nazareth that did that. Now, they watched him grow up. Do you think they ever saw him do one main thing? Do you think he ever said one bad word that they heard? Do you think he did service hours for everybody in that town? That they would have known him well, and yet all of a sudden when he tells them he's the Messiah, they're going to kill him. Same with Jeremiah. He claims to be a prophet of the living God. He speaks against their sins and evil. Even his own hometown, family and friends are going to kill him. He becomes a type for the Son of God. I would put by that verse 21, Luke chapter 4, verse 24. Luke 4, verse 24, which perhaps you'll find will be of some help also. Now, chapter 12. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? See the question mark? Do you know what that means? means you're supposed to answer it. Do the wicked prosper in the world you and I live in? Yeah, they do really well. You have noticed that, haven't you? They hold high government positions. They are prominent in sports and in all kinds of activities. They do really well. Surely by now, members of this church have figured out mortality is not fair. It was never intended to be fair. That's how you test the loyalty of a people. When they see the wicked prosper and they suffer and go without and have problems, and what? It's not fair. If God loves me, then why does he let them have all that and I don't? Well, figure out in a hurry. Mortality was never intended to be fair. Life on this earth isn't fair. But be patient. Let the wicked enjoy it. They only have it for a brief season anyway, and then you'll inherit the earth and all its uh, the fullness of it one day. Just be patient and just hang on. Two, thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root. In other words, they do well. They grow, they produce, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth. In other words, they speak righteousness, yet they're wicked and far from their reins. But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter. He wants the Lord to do what with the wicked? Get rid of them. We the same way? Surely by now you've longed for the day when Christ comes and the wicked are removed. And it won't bother my heart at all when he removes the wicked off this earth. I think that's a wonderful day. I hope it soon comes and they're removed and the rest of us can live in peace with the master. Okay, that's what he's saying. For how long shall a land mourn and the herbs of every field wither and so forth? Now, watch God's answer. It must have shocked Jeremiah. And surely it ought to have an impact on you and I also. He says, if thou, Jeremiah, hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, worn thee out, made thee tired, then how canst thou contend with horses? Do you know what he just said to that poor man? If you think it's been bad, Jeremiah, hang on. You've seen nothing yet. So far, I've only had you running with the footmen. I'm about to have you run with the horses. That's going to be tougher, is it not? And that's what he's saying to them. He didn't answer the question that he asked. Why do the wicked prosper? All God said to him is, be patient. The best is yet to come. You haven't seen any tests and trials yet as to what will happen. Well, look at what happened to Joseph Smith and to so many others and the things they went through. I would note by that these references by verse 1 through 4 particularly. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 1 through 4 where he asks a similar question. Malachi 3 13 to 15. And interesting enough read that one close the Lord will help you and answer there. Malachi 3 13 to 15. And then Miracle of Forgiveness President Kimball's book page 26 to 27. Now let's go over here to verse 14. Thus saith the Lord against all mine evil neighbors that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land. Them are the neighbors. They are the Gentiles. 
and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. He will bring Judah out of those Gentile nations. That's not fully fulfilled yet. A lot of the Jewish people live in America. They don't want to go to the Middle East. I don't blame them. It's a lot better off here than over there at times. He says, and it shall come to pass after that I've plucked them, them, the antecedent of them is them in 14 and neighbors. You need to connect all of that. And also Judah. That I have plucked them out, I will return and have compassion on them, on who? Gentiles and Judah. And will bring them again, every man to his heritage and every man to his land. In other words, God promises that the Gentiles will be gathered to the house of Israel if they want to come. That mission to them is opened in Acts chapter 10, long ago by Peter. The time of the Gentiles is fast ending. We turn our time and efforts now only to Israel. He says, have compassion on them, will bring them again, every man to his heritage, every man to his land. It shall come to pass if they, Gentiles, will diligently learn the ways, it takes time and effort, a process, of my people, if they'll learn of covenant Israel, to swear by my name means to covenant in the name of God, the living God, the Lord liveth. In other words, they covenant that they know God, they love the living God, and they want to be part of this great work. As they taught my people to swear by Baal, then shall they be built in the midst of my people. That is a great promise that God makes. I would note by it Isaiah chapter 60, verse 12, where also you will receive some uh, help with those verses. Brothers and sisters, that's where we'll close tonight. We'll try and do about that many chapters each time. We'll spend about four times on Jeremiah. And I close tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There won't be any closing prayer, brother and sisters.